So today I would like to speak about why is violence on the rise? It seems like almost on a daily basis, you read the news, um, uh, you uh, social media, just both the United States and abroad, you feel a sense of uh, a heightened tensions, whether it's racism or discrimination or anti-Semitism, um, uh, that, and really acts of violence. I don't, can't really say it's on the rise in the big picture sense because if you really look at the trajectory, you know, Steven Pinker and other researchers have shown that it's actually on the decline in the big picture. But for some reason recently, things seem to have accelerated. And uh, is it perhaps because everything is broadcast now? So we're all aware immediately of any unrest or any type of attack or shooting or uh, killing in the sense where we're constantly aware of it more? It's hard to say. But some think the pandemic and COVID has definitely brought out the best in some, but also the worst in some. So I want to talk about this because it affects us all. It creates a climate, even if, God, thank God, we are protected and we're not affected directly, but it creates a climate of, of uncertainty. It increases that, the fears, and, just, uh, and also in general, the human hope for a better world. You know, just when we thought that things were getting better in a broader sense of the word, it comes to haunt us that you know, there's so much hate out there and anger, uh, and frustration. Because logically, if you think about it, why would be human beings altogether resort to violence? You know, there are many ways to resolve issues. And I say it with a sigh, because it really troubles me when I think about it, especially coming from the teachings of mysticism, where we taught how all of us are part of one larger picture, or all part of one mosaic, even those of us that disagree, our diversity is essentially the multitudes of nature is diverse, but at the same time has a certain harmony. When you see violence, when you see anger, when you see people literally hurting each other, abusing each other, killing each other, it just upsets the very, that very resonating sense of, of, of that there's something that connects us all. So that and many more other factors that are worthwhile speaking about. <clears throat> Now, of course, there are always the usual suspects, things like video games, violence on TV, and in Hollywood, we're exposed to it in sports. You see people, well, even football, tackling each other without mercy. With all the rules being written, it's still somewhat of a violent sport. And other places where violence seems to be part of life. Then you have, of course, the political polarization that feeds a type of uh, real animosity to others. And animosity is not violence, but it still it crosses lines that some people may get them, push them over the edge, as we see it again and again. There some talk about gun control, the, avail the availability and accessibility. I mean, the list goes on. As you probably can imagine, I'm not going to be speaking so much on the symptomatic level, which is, of course, all these things should be addressed, which is, of course, the, the, to make sure guns are in the hands of responsible people or altogether not in the hands of anybody if you can control it. And the same with minimizing violence and aggression that, that our children and we are exposed to. That all goes without saying. But there's something more, and that goes back to the root. And it takes me back to 1999. In 1999, you may recall in April, was the Columbine School, where students, excellent students actually, and considered normal students, not mentally ill or unstable, went in with guns and ammunition and weapons, and they turned on their own friends, killing a bunch of them, and then killing themselves. It wasn't the only time there was school violence, but you know, every violence is terrible, but in a violence in a school is particularly acutely focuses because the school is supposed to be one of those places of an oasis of peace. Whether it was Sandy Hook or other places, it's always disturbing seeing children coming to study, their formative years being ripped away from life by these attacks. Besides those being killed, 
just a disruption of one of these places that should be a clean zone, you know, war-free. And yet, we saw what happened. By Columbine, it was particularly, if I recall, it was particularly disturbing because they couldn't find any reason that these students did it. So let me share something that happened during that time. We're talking now um, 22 years ago. So I traveled then to Sydney, Australia for a speaking tour. And, um, and I spoke at a school there. Mariah is the name, a high school. It's a Jewish high school, a uh, multicultural, a, a, a non-segregated high school. And I spoke, it was a Friday morning volunteer, meaning the students weren't, wasn't required for them to attend. But a good few hundred students showed up. I'm talking about the ages 14 to 17, boys and girls. It was in a big gymnasium, I remember. And um, I was told I could speak whatever I like to speak about. So I opened up because it was right after the Columbine shooting. I asked them, do you think a thing like that could happen, God forbid, in a school like this? I was sure they would tell me, this is America, violence, blah, blah. In Australia, we're a peaceful country. Most of them raised their hand, yeah, they absolutely believe it could happen here. Despite being a Jewish school, being taught morals and values. So I said to them, why? Why do you think that happened? That students, it wasn't some criminals coming from outside attacking a school for ideological purposes. It was just a plain cold-blooded shooting. And they couldn't even find a, uh, it was like thrill killer. They couldn't even find the motive. Why do you think? So we went around, I listened to different people raise their hands. I mean, some things were childish, some things were quite insightful. But there was one thing that jumped out at me, which I touched upon, which of course I was leading up to. And I said, how much do you think those students valued life itself? And a few of them, a few of the students in the, in the, in the Mariah Gymnasium that Friday morning raised their hands and said, yes, absolutely. I don't think life is that valuable. And if his life is not that valuable, even your own life, let alone other people's lives, it's easier to cross lines. That doesn't mean just because a person doesn't think life is valuable, they're going to be a mass murderer or even kill one person, but it doesn't help. And we began this discussion, which was fascinating to me. And, the, and I said, so how many of you think your lives really matter? And very few raised their hands. They said, I'm trying to make, make ends meet. I'm going to go to school, try to succeed at something, excel, and then become, find a job, make some money. But when we started talking about the very essential question, how valuable is your life? Is it indispensable? It was sad to hear that many do not think it was. Many thought, hey, you know what? I'm one person among billions of people on this planet. And what emerged from it all, and this is not by no means a scientific or a definitive or exhaustive study, that when you don't feel your life matters that much and you're bored and you've thrown a few other factors, it's not that difficult to imagine that someone is going to, and of course, witnessing violence, that someone may decide an experiment. And remember that book called The Compulsion, I think it was. It was a story, it was like a fictional account of what happened actually with... Um, with uh, in the 30s, where two excellent students decided just to see what it feels like they killed an innocent boy. It was a big thing in the news. So this book, which later became a film, was a, it was a big story in the 50s. And it was because of their brilliance that they were able to be aloof and detached and see how it feels without having a conscience, no motive at all. They were caught because one of them had left their eyeglasses there. But without a motive, it's very hard to, to find uh, a, the criminals because... There's no strings. There's no one that doesn't trace you to anyone. Absolutely no motive. They randomly chose someone. So again, I'm not suggesting this is someone, everyone, I think every, something everyone's going to do. But when you throw into the equation that life is not absolutely sacred and our relationships are not sacred, then there's really nothing that really stops you except just your own either resistance to violence. In this case, of course, it was pure murder. So we have that. Growing up in homes, we have a conscience. We have values. 
But that I found to be a very critical component, and I want to share that with you today. And that is, we live in a world where we're not taught that life is sacred. Number one, we're just basically accidents. We've evolved from bacteria, which in turn evolved from even more primitive species, and here we are. A mutation or just an evolutionary process with no necessarily purpose, no design, no intention. So if you don't feel you really matter, your decisions don't really matter, and other people don't really matter. I know it's a far cry from going ahead and hurting someone, but it's definitely the beginning of a process. Whereas if you do see something sacred, that changes it all. I'm always reminded of this beautiful story. So it was with the the name of Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, the previous Chabad Rebbe, was as a child or maybe an adult, he was walking with his father in a garden. They were having a conversation about life, about meaning. And the son, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak, tore off a leaf from a tree and began to rub it. You know, people do that without even thinking. His father reprimanded him in a way that he never forgot. How could you disturb the trajectory of this leaf's life. What do you know about its journey? You just rip it off and rub it for no reason. A leaf. It's sacred. The mystics explain that the leaf has divine sparks, has spiritual energy, and it's absolutely necessary. We may not understand how it's necessary, but we also don't understand many things. We have almost, we have between 30 and 75 trillion cells in the human body, we understand the, for the purpose of each one of them. Yet, should one be, mutate, what kind of havoc it can wreak? An extra chromosome or chromosome less? A computer program. have millions of lines of code. Add a dot or take out a dot, and the whole thing won't work or even become destructive. So we see today that it's not about quantity. Size does not matter. Quality. And we cannot measure Things in that way. Everything has purpose. Mozart reportedly or purportedly said to the Archduke of Austria who listened to his music and the Archduke who thought he was some connoisseur of music says to Mozart, Dear Mozart, beautiful music but far too many notes. And Mozart purportedly replied, But not one, Your Majesty, more than necessary. So we don't appreciate the sanctity of individual things today, quite, this, quite the way it was perhaps in the past. And we even dismiss the past as being primitive, religious beliefs, etc. There's a sanctity to life, and there's a sanctity to every aspect of life. If I consider your life sacred, don't you think it'll cause me much... Men- to pause many times over before I in any way touch or hurt you? If I see my life sacred, I will not hurt myself? Sanctity of life and individual life has become somewhat diluted. Not saying for everyone, but generally that's a trend. I have no doubt that's a contributing factor. Again, I do not think there's one reason for any violence. There's always more reasons. But that's an aspect now I know some will say, one second, some people find their lives very sacred, but they completely dismiss someone else's life because they feel either you're inferior or your religion is worthless or for religious beliefs I have to eradicate every heretic. You know, some people justified racism or anti-Semitism on, those ba- on that basis. But think about it. If you, don't sanct- if you don't respect the sanctity of another life and you're arguing the name of God, then how much do you really respect the sanctity of your life? Maybe just being arrogant does not mean that you consider yourself indispensable. So indispensability is connected to higher purpose. Now I know this sounds highfalutin and philosophical and abstract. No, my friends, it's not. It's something that we need to teach ourselves and teach our children. Every morning, every evening, every moment of the day, your life is sacred. The choices you make are critical and important. It's not optional. It's not negligible. Doesn't matter what you see on in, on shows or hear music or see around you. 
And the fact is, when people see children, especially impressionable children, see that their parents are adults and educators, do find, do behave in ways that are not fully respectful of another, what do you think? They come away. Again, things are not that sacred. Relationships are not that sacred. And I'm not making a religious argument. I just want to make that clear. The mere fact, for instance, that you see in every, basically every show, people are just with each other, intimately sleeping with each other. You never hear that there's a commitment involved. Just tells you that the society has come down to it that there is no such thing as a sacred commitment. So subliminally, or more, less than subliminally, it leaves a message. Now again, that doesn't mean it leads to violence. But everything you have to begin psychologically, where's the line that you cross? So when I look around at the world today and I see it seemingly trends, and I see at the same time the lack of that sanctity, the lack of preciousness. If someone's afraid of the word sacred, let's use the word precious, valuable. The lack of value is always going to make you feel more lax with other people's rights. Because this doesn't just talk about violence in the literal sense, it also talks about respecting another's rights. Does another human being have a right to their opinion? Oh no, if they don't agree with you, something's wrong with them and we need to dismiss them or cancel them or some other other way demoralize and minimize them. Does, Does someone else have to be wrong for me to be right? Is there a sanctity, a value to another opinion? It all comes back down to who we are. So when you look in the Kabbalistic model, the mystical model, the biblical model, human being was created in the divine image. You're a piece of divine. You're a piece of transcendence. You're a very piece of infinity. That is not something negligible. And so is another. And we are all indispensable Musical notes in a large composition, not one more than necessary, and not one less, meaning it's a perfect balance. And it's our mission is to uphold that balance and value it and cherish it and actually enhance it by developing better relationships. If we're kinder to each other, our relationship becomes stronger. It's no different than the cells in your body, the parts in your body being able to work better. What is a healthy human being? So in all the parts of his system are working well with each other in one smooth, seamless flow. What is lack of health? When there's some impediment, something severed, some dissonance, some disconnect. Violence is just an extreme expression of deep dissonance and deep disconnect. It begins with that we don't feel we're one with each other. Is it possible for the right hand to be violent or attack their left hand? Not when it feels it's part of one entity, if that happens, we know it's autoimmune diseases where the body t- turns on itself. is quite devastating. The same thing on the collective level, all of us human beings. So it doesn't begin with violence and murder. It begins with a small disconnect, which then widens to the point where you can get angry and judgmental and dismissive to the point that it gets worse, biases and prejudices, and discrimination, and racism, and anti-Semitism, and to the point that it goes a little further, and that rift becomes something that you're ready to act upon. Will everyone go through all those steps? Not necessarily. But once a little severing has happened, as soon as you do not feel you're part of another, that's where the problems begin. That's where you want to nip it in the bud. That's how you create preventive medicine. You don't wait till it gets to a point of total anarchy or total total destruction where one turns on the other, what we call war, battle. So in these times of upheaval and disruption, which on one hand can bring out the worst in us, it could also bring out the best in us, it's critical to revisit and return to the very glue, the very fabric that connects us all. And just like physics today teaches us that subatomic particles and atoms are aware of each other, even though they're billions of miles away, we too are connected, whether we know it or we're not, or we don't. And to allow superficial, or what we convince ourselves, deeper differences, to come to a point that it's not just diversity, but it's divisiveness, which can lead to much worse, is the worst possible crime, because everything originates from there. 
Just as love is the secret to all health, hatred is the secret to everything that's not healthy. If one part of your body hates another part of the body, figuratively or literally, there's a serious problem. Even if it's not acting yet on it. So love is more than just romantic love. It's not more than just intimacy. Love is actually attachment, connection, a symbiosis of different forces at work, all working toward one end, even though they're very different. Now, you can call me a dreamer. You can call me naive. I live my life driven by that vision that that's fully possible. Do you achieve it all in one shot? No. You don't bite off more than you can chew. You take it one step at a time. But you always remain the person who's part of the solution, not part of the, not part of the problem. <clears throat> that wherever you go, you try to engender and try to cultivate that sense of connection. And even with people that may be very different than you, may even be very, you may totally disagree with, there's still something to connect with. I've had my share of arguments. I've had my share of disagreements with people on different levels. And I always make sure at the end of any conversation or, conversa- or whether it's in person or online, to say at the end of the day, we're connected. We're both part of something greater. People feel very, some disturbed, some are disarmed. Like, why are you saying that? We just had this terrible disagreement. It's terrible. I don't see it as a terrible disagreement. I said we had disagreed on certain points. But we're still all souls, and we're still all musical notes of this larger composition. Imagine if we were all able to do that, conclude a conversation that way. Does it solve all the problems automatically? No. But it creates a climate, an environment, where it's possible. And we begin, step by step, begin by those that are around you, in your own home, children, family, siblings, parents, children, then widen it to your friends and colleagues, your social companions, in person or online. If we create such a conversation, it has its effect, its ripple effect. Try it out. What do we have to lose? What do you have to lose? What do I have to lose? I'm driven by this, and this is one of the reasons I do exactly what you see me doing right now. Trying to bring it to the fore. Let's bring it to the surface. Talk talk about it. It's a good beginning. And I hope you join me in this effort, each in our own way. And that reason, I'd love to hear from you, your comments, your feedback, critique as well, yes. And let us create that circle of love, that connecting the links, one large chain, which really also connects us back in history to the generations past, and also hopefully to the generations that come. Be blessed, be well and healthy. We're all part of this larger picture. And God bless you all. This is Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Live, every Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Please check me out, check us out at MeaningfulLife.com. That's our homepage, that's our website. A robust offerings of programs, calendar, different topics and issues. Trying to connect Us all, each of us finding our unique mission, finding that common denominator that connects the multitudes to find the true harmony within our diversity. Be well, my friends. Good talking to you.